Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Abraham. I'm with A&M Industrial. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this session is part of what we're calling a, a virtual A&M University. Last year, we started A&M University. We had a, a big day. We had classes. We had vendor booths. We had a great um, meeting, and everyone got together. This year, we're doing it, of course, virtually. And so this presentation is part of what we're calling, again, virtual A&M University. For those of you who are less familiar with A&M, I just wanted to share with you a little bit. We're very proud of our new interactive product guide, which you see here on the right. It can be downloaded as a PDF file from our website, highlighting some key products from our portfolio. What is unique is that they have links to more information about the products, product videos, and in some cases, links to buy and view online. On the left, you see our new buyer's guide, which outlines the different areas that we are involved with. Today, we're gonna to focus, of course, on temperature screening, but we also have experts on staff in cutting tools and abrasives, mill supplies, tape and packaging, pipes, valves, and fittings, including steam generation and distribution, tools, fluid handling and hose assemblies, safety products and services, janitorial and cleaning supplies, including sanitizers and disinfectant, material handling and storage, and we also manage customer inventories with our AIM Vendor Managed Inventory Program. For the last few months, we've been focusing with our customers on the things that keep their employees safe and keep their operator, their facilities running, whether it's masks, gloves, cleaning fluid, those kinds of things. So we added a page to our website that highlights all those things. And if you're in need of any of those things, feel free to go there after this presentation is over. Today, we're gonna to talk about, um, with our, with our FLIR expert, elevated skin temperature screening. As you know, that's one of the ways we're all screening to keep our workplaces safe. For those of you who are less familiar with FLIR, FLIR actually took its name from the acronym for Forward Looking Infrared, which is their specialty. So according to Wikipedia, FLIR Systems is the world's largest commercial company specializing in the design and production of thermal imaging cameras, components, and imaging sensors. Based in Oregon and founded in 1978, the company makes thermal cameras and components for a wide variety of commercial and government applications. Today, we have Ryan Boyle. Ryan Boyle has over 15 years of experience in industrial engineering and is a level one thermographer. He has been offering these seminars to organizations around the country. He may mention that to you, and he's doing quite a few of these. He's quite an expert. During the presentation, I will be checking for any questions or chats, and I will interrupt him if there is something that uh, he can answer along the way. As well, we will also be uh, op we give opportunities at the end for questions. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over controls to Ryan. And Ryan, uh, it's all yours now to take over and uh, take us through the topic. Great, thank you everybody. Let me just give me a second here to uh, pull up the presentation. All right, so again, as uh, thank you, Mark, for for the lovely introduction. I couldn't say it better myself. I might I might have to uh, write down a few a few of those things you said about me. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate everybody taking some time out of their day to jump on the call this morning. Um, what we're going to be specifically talking about is how FLIR, FLIR is battling COVID-19. So generally, when you think of FLIR, we think of thermal, right? So a lot of people may have heard of us from military to search and rescue. We're actually only 59% thermal. 41% of our business is non-thermal so test instruments um, we own x-tech so any environmental electrical and you name it if it needs to be tested we we make a meter for that um, specifically in, in this presentation though we're going to be talking more about our, our specialty thermal um, as mark kind of alluded to we are the world's leader in in thermal imaging we own 90 percent market share in thermal imaging 
and we actually spend more in research and development than the next closest company sells in thermal imaging. So what are we doing for the problems of today? What are, what are the problems of today, right? Here you see some images of long lines, travel restrictions, hospital visits, some of the solutions, social distancing, uh, masks, PPE, and elevated skin temperature scanning. And you, you may have seen this in numerous different renditions over the last several months all over, all over the media. So what we're gonna review over the next few slides and the next few minutes is what makes FLIR's solution the best solution for elevated skin temperature reading. So to give you a, a little bit of a basis, as Mark mentioned, I am a, a level one thermographer and I'm kind of a nerd for the science aspect of it. I, I don't wanna beat you guys over the head with science first thing in the morning, so we'll, we'll make it short. But what you're seeing with an infrared camera are wavelengths of light that we can't see to our to the human eye so the human eye sees visible light right uh roy g biv if you remember art class back in elementary school uh all, all the colors in the prism is what we can see infrared purely sees heat radiation so everything other than the deepest dark darkest parts of outer space radiates heat energy that's what these cameras are reading um it could be used to see in total darkness this is security cameras uh, military scopes rifle scopes uh aircraft guidance systems uh search and rescue firefighters will use it for hot spots and forest fires or to find a potential victim in a house what prior to three months ago that we mostly dealt with when it came to thermal was measuring temperature on say electrical equipment uh, motors switch gear transformers doing preventative maintenance comparing today was 100 degrees and a week from now it's up to 150 why right um we're kind of doing the same thing here but it's a little trickier with skin temperature than it is in inanimate object right So you'll see an image here on the left of what our solution will kind of look like. You may have seen other images that look similar to this. So what kind of differentiates it and makes you know it's a FLIR image is that, that box with the two indicators in it. So what this does is it provides a surface temperature without contact. It does not measure body core temperature so this is not internal body temperature that you're reading is not meant to replace a, a thermometer but it's it's non-contact it can be and is currently being used for elevated skin temperature screening it is not a medical device you'll hear me say this probably 15 times throughout this I, i'll try to limit it a little bit it is not a medical device but it is a first line defense in a large, large picture of a process. So I explained a little bit of how thermal works. I wanna get into a little more of why ours works the best and what, what we do differently with the science that I kind of briefly explained to you and how it pertains to skin temperature measurement. So on the right, you'll see an image of a gentleman's face with a box or a rectangle around it. And there's a red crosshairs on, on his inner tear duct. So the way thermal cameras work specifically, inside that little tiny circle in that crosshair are anywhere from one pixel to hundreds of pixels, depending on the camera that you're using, the quality of the detector that you're using. Our cameras are higher quality that have the screening mode. So they have hundreds, if not thousands of pixels in a spot. The reason why this matters, the more pixels you can put on a spot, the, the more accurate your reading will be. 
one pixel is significantly less accurate than a thousand pixels. The that's the short of it, right? So this is new for the majority of the world right now, especially the United States, right? This has impacted other countries previously more so, and we might have read about it, but now it's really hitting home. For for FLIR, this is something that's almost been ever present. It's almost within 10 years of FLIR starting as a company, actually 10 years prior to FLIR actually starting as a company, but 10 years after thermal imaging was invented, they were using it for medical reasons. You see that on the left, 1968, Thermovision. It was owned by a company called Agema. Well, FLIR Systems purchased Agema in 1998. The first big use of this for this exact purpose was a SARS outbreak in 2003. Shortly after that, the, the success and the widespread use of it led to us applying for and receiving FDA 510K registration approval in 2004. Since then, um, we've kind of been the, the go-to resource for anyone from the, the military to different government to business all over the world from 2009 with H1N1 to Ebola and now again, coronavirus. There's been endless research papers done on our on our products, on our screening methods. Um, obviously, FDA does not just throw around an approval without doing a lot of research. I can send out after this meeting rather than reading page after page of medical jargon. I can forward some of this out to you guys afterwards uh, for you to review, but just know it, it is out there. If you go on the FDA website, I'll put a link in here shortly. You can read up on the specifics of it. So how does our screening mode work? You may you may have seen other method, methods of it. You may have seen our methods of it. It's something you would deplo deploy at checkpoints. So think uh, carousel doors when you walk in, uh, security checkpoints, gates, doors, standard in and out locations. What you're looking to do is measure a person's temperature as they're walking in that door or before, or shortly after they're entering the building. And with this process, set an alarm to notify a person or a system of an alarm, whatever that alarm temperature might be. So how are we getting this temperature? What are we measuring? I mentioned it. A little bit ago we're going after the tear ducts the reason why we target and the reason why we have the fda approval for this has to do with these tear ducts and it comes down to um the the tear ducts are very difficult to manipulate environmental factors don't really affect it whereas say the forehead or other parts of the human body are very, very much so susceptible to manipulation or environmental factors. What what environmental factors am I talking about? Uh, the time of day. If it's 12 o'clock in the desert versus 6 a.m. in the desert, the temperature is going to be vastly different, and that can affect a person's skin temperature. It does not necessarily affect the tear ducts quite as much. Um, activity level, human body types, just humans in general all have different body temperatures, and it goes on and on. So how do you, how do you make this a good process, right? So what an outside third-party company did was they did a study of employees walking in to a uh, a business throughout the day, and they took their temperatures, twenty people throughout the day, and monitor it to see how it varied throughout the day, different times, same person, different temperature readings all day long. Without getting into too much detail on this, the reason why we we need to know this is we don't have false positives. Um, if everybody is standing outside in a hot parking lot and it's 110 degrees out, 
and the alarm set at I don't know 100 everybody walking in is is going to be relatively warm and it could alarm if you're targeting the forehead if you're targeting the tear ducts just a little bit closer to accurate temperature so what our process does and this is the real point of why it's FDA approved is we're using a, a reference temperature as an average of the, of the first 10 people or the last 10 people. So it's a, a rolling average of people coming in. So if the environment is changing outdoors, this rolling average of 10 will be changing with it, right? After we go through that process, we now have an average temp temperature, sampled average temperature, right? At this point, we take those same 10, say the first 10 people on a shift. It's 6 a.m., first 10 people set an average. Now they walk back through again. If, say, one of those people are over temperature, if somebody does have a fever, it will still indicate so. It'll still be above the average. That's why we're using an average. Think back to science class, having a, a control, right? What we're looking for here is the measured temperature, which is the red cross hair on the tear duct. That's what's indicating this, this gentleman's body temperature, his tear duct temperature. The sample average is what we're looking at as our target, right? Our average temperature. And now the alarm is X amount of degrees over that we're looking for. So a lot of companies are setting it at say three degrees. I've seen military uses low as one degree. It's an alarm function that you're, you're setting and it will indicate on the camera. It has an onboard speaker or um, micro, speaker and microphone that can alarm audibly or it will actually flash on that alarm red, which can go back to a screen or monitor um or it can be done right off the camera um black body elevated skin temperature screening is popping up everywhere so a lot of other products out there require a black body but we at the beginning of coronavirus this was a huge question we got all the time and the short of it is Black bodies are used to set that reference temperature. So what we're using as a rolling average for accuracy reasons and the take out false positives, such as a person walks in with a hot cup of coffee and you're scanning more than just your face, that hot cup of coffee is going to alarm. Um, the reason why black bodies are used is the detectors in cameras that are requiring this are less accurate than a FLIR thermal detector. So they need this black body to calibrate every day, every X amount of hours, depending on the unit, that temperature. And it's a set temperature, say 98 degrees. The, the problem in that is, as we explained, the human temp body temperature isn't always 98 degrees. So you're, you're, when you're using a black body, you're setting an average that it doesn't necessarily match the the environment i'm not saying that these can't be used with FLIR solutions um as a safety net if you want to think of just to confirm that your camera is reading the temperature you want to see it reading but before FLIR sends out our cameras and is shipped out to your locations each camera goes through a rigorous calibration process of about 15 to 20 black bodies. And these units are upwards of $40,000 a piece, much more sophisticated than what you see in this image here. And it ranges anywhere from negative 50 degrees all the way up to, I believe, 3000 degrees in increments. And we use them to calibrate our cameras before we ship them out. Our detectors are sensitive enough that they we don't require a black body as part of our screening process. The the rolling average rules out the need for that, along with the the measurement of the the tear ducts. Uh, again, we are the leader in not just thermal but elevated skin temperature screening with thermal. Ryan, the, 
Right. We yes, have sir. a question, if that's okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. Here's the question. How close is eye duct temperature to internal body temperature? If we needed to confirm the eye duct temperature, where else can we measure? I hear the mouth under the tongue can do this. That's the question. Uh, that I cannot say I'm an expert on. It varies. Uh, there's a lot of factors on why it would vary. If you think back to uh, childhood, Ryan, trying to stay home from school, there's, I'm not saying every person is manipulating under their tongue, but it can be done. But likewise, there's different factors measuring with a thermometer internally than there are externally. So it's hard, just like it's hard to say every human being is 98 degrees, it's hard to give you an exact percent error, if you will, between the tear duct and that. But if you click on, if you go to the FDA website, and I'll put the link out there for you guys, you can click into that, and there are studies done. And again, the, the number does vary, but it is, been studied time and time again, and it is the closest correlation to actual internal body temperature, non-contact, that is. Um, if you think in the electrical world, a uh, thermocouple, or even in the baking world, a thermocouple is touching something. So it is going to be a certain amount more accurate than non-contact, but the point of the non-contact is always safety, right? I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I can follow up with some information that'll give you a little more detail on what that difference is. Anything else or keep going for a minute? Keep going. All righty. So what is our, what does our process look like? So picture this as an entrance. Um, I've seen it used in Amazon shipping locations to uh, naval facilities making nuclear subs. And everybody's concern is flow. Um, casinos and food establishments, they want it to be extremely uninterrupted. That's the whole point of it is the environment. Whereas a manufacturing facility or a military base, they're not as concerned about your comfort because you're standing in multiple security locations anyway. Um, what we're, this process does is it does need dedicated choke points, if you will, scanning locations that employees must funnel through for individual screening. At that point, they stand in front of a thermal camera, get their temperature read. It takes a matter of a second or less. Uh, they do have to remove glasses and hats there is a new software that was released yesterday morning i could provide a little more details on that aids in this but it notifies you if you're above temperature below temperature if alarm is set the alarmed individual individual goes off to another section where say maybe a triage is set up with a nurse for further further medical evaluation this is where you would use a uh, under the tongue thermometer to to verify the readings or if they pass they continue through with but with, the main point is flow is not interrupted there's no stopping at any point other than a quick second scan which might be the equivalent of scanning your badge um if you're like me you gotta scan your badge 15 times sometimes to get into a door so it might be a little quicker what what does tomorrow look like we don't know and it changes state by state. It's different for everybody on this call right now, right? Some of the, the methods and the screening modes out there that are becoming acceptable aren't acceptable by FDA guidelines. That doesn't mean they're not valuable, right? FLIR offers products at a very high caliber of accuracy. We do offer lower end cameras too, and I can't say that they won't come out in smaller packages down the line. Right now, what really differentiates our cameras from every other solution out there for skin temperature monitoring is the accuracy and the, the repeatability of this process. 
um, no false positives. So I alluded to it before, a lot of other manufacturers solutions out there are trying to do crowd scanning. And we get a lot of questions on crowd scanning. But the main issue is uh, I was dealing with a casino in upstate New York. Obviously, they want to have people just come in in this crowd and like their typical security cameras be watching all the time, but you don't know they're there. The, the problem with that is you have 10 people, several of which are holding ice cold beers at the casino. Several have hot cups of coffee. Those are alarms. You're, you're taking in those temperatures into your data and they're either creating an error or a false alarm on your software or your camera, or they're improperly adjusting your average because a hot cup of coffee or a cold beer are drastically different than human body temperature. So the, the whole reason why our process is done the way it is and up till current day is the only FDA approved process is that repeatability over time day in day out you won't have false alarms and it will you turn it on i don't want to say set it and forget it because it sounds like an infomercial but you turn it on and you set it up and it runs itself it's a full turnkey solution this is it's a solution we've been delivering for over 10 years now um, specifically this application and previously in other ones such as Ebola and so on. Um, a big benefit of it is the handheld solutions are easy to use and rapid to deploy. They do have the ability to integrate into existing systems. We have a strong supply chain here at FLIR. I'm not saying there aren't extended lead times. If you're previously bought a camera from FLIR, generally you get it re relatively quickly. Currently, with current situation, there is lead times, and I will send out an email after this addressing those, and feel free to reach out to me for specifics. Um, again, it, the biggest difference is the FDA 510K registration. We're the, the only FDA approved. So is it a medical device? I think I did a good job in not saying it's not 50 times, but no, it is not a not classified as a medical device. We do have an FDA 510K approval for our cameras. Um, in my past life, I'm a registered dietitian. I'm very familiar with the FDA. I'm sure most of you are not. Click on the link when I send this out to you guys afterwards. And it, it does have good information in there that your, your average non-FDA speaking person can read through, but it also has legal documents as well that might be useful. So, so what do our products look like? What, what is it that we're talking about to have the screening mode? You'll see here on the left are our handheld options, the EXX and T-Series cameras. These are the mobile tripod mount, might already be in some of your facilities, being utilized for electrical inspections. These cameras are used in endless applications in everyday life prior to COVID. So please check with your departments to see if they do have one, if you want to test it or demo it. I've had numerous times where I sent my demo unit out and it found a friend out there when they realized they had the same camera already on site. Um, fixed mount solutions, these are closer to a, a security camera uh, for the OnVIF and integrated solutions out there. This, this would fit into that. And then the IR temp gun on the right, the IR200, this is something you've, probably seen every way from Sunday in household inspections or Home Depots and Harbor Freights. The big difference is this is also FDA approved. This one's also extremely accurate, but you have to get relatively close within six to 12 inches. The, the less accurate handheld ones like this IR200 are as close as one inch for accurate. So please, please read that before you purchase anything similar to it. Ryan, Ryan, so before you leave that, go back if you would. Yep. Another question. Uh, Somebody is saying their company also pur purchased an IR200 in addition to a T540. Is there a reason to use them together? Yep. So if you, um, if I go back a few slides real quick to this, how that screening process works, right? Just give me one second. 
there's a little bit of lag when I'm doing this, and I know I'm going to skip right past it. Here we go. So, in this scenario here that I was referencing before, the T540 will be in the first blue box that says EBT screening, right? That might be anything from a person holding it to a tripod run to a computer screen or an iPad or tablet at a safe distance alarming, right? Person comes in, they scan on the FLIR T540 at 102 degrees, right? I don't know why they're walking in at 102 degrees, but they just did. What do we do without interrupting our line? They get sent off to the medical evaluation area where the IR200 would be typically used. Um, this would be the first step for a nurse to non-contact touch a person. So if she scans it with this IR200, and for some reason there's an error or discrepancy that gives her cause to investigate further um back to the thermometer under the tongue this is the point where the ir the ir200 might be the first step in that process before the internal temperature reading because i mean let's be honest that's a that's a personal thing to have happen on your way into work right so non-contact is not only good for not spreading germs but there's also a certain comfort thing in there and that's where these non-medical devices help with their non-contact as well good so i got another question again related to our earlier question mm -hmm. um how close is the eye duct temperature to actual internal body temperature is there a set there a typical difference in temperature a degree a fraction of a degree or what is it that's the same question the exact same question i can send out information there is not an exact difference so it, it varies just like my body temperature might be 96 degrees and yours might be 98 the internal temperature varies from your external temperature okay um i again i'll send more information out afterwards you can read more detail there are endless studies on that correlation um there i can't say it's 0.5 degrees celsius like i can say the accuracy of our detectors are but i can say that there are, are loads of studies out there that i can forward you that show the correlation to it and it's been deemed by the fda the the best correlation to internal temperature it is not meant to replace an medical device an internal medical device though all right yeah so you'll see here the, the main deal i'm not going to read through all the main benefits and features of all the different cameras um you can see it here and read through after after our meeting but the main difference is is cost and deployability or non-contact and having to be closer distance distance is a big factor in these so you'll see here with the the ir 200 you have to be under six inches is the optimal distance this is where you're using it in that second you don't want to be walking up six inches to every employee when you have two thousand employees walking into a facility so this is used in that second location the medical evaluation area and you you see these used in a lot of a lot of nurse uh, quick care urgent care facilities previously prior to this or there the you the alternative is the rolling forehead the ball right we see that used a lot uh the the e series exx series cameras is the e75 85 95 without reading all the the key differences the biggest difference comes down to pixels and again i said the more pixels you can put on a target the more accurate it will be with these cameras it directly relates to distance. So an E75 will, can give you accurate temperatures, say 10 to 12 feet, where an E95, 15 to 20 feet. That's, for this application, the, the main difference. We're not looking at high temperatures versus low temperatures or anything like that, like we might in a, a typical um, industrial environment. Uh, these 
cameras have interchangeable lenses. So what do we do after after all this, right? And please excuse my, my dogs. I have probably Amazon showing up at my house because after quarantine, I've invested in lots of Amazon stock. But um, the cameras you currently have, or if you purchase cameras now, what do we do after after the new norm goes back to the old norm, if it does, right? A lot of these cameras previously, if you wanted to change out a lens for a different application, it had to be sent back to be to FLIR to be recalibrated. These modern day cameras self-calibrate. So if you want to extend the distance on a FLIR E95, you can change out a narrow or focused lens and now you can use it to inspect, say, the roof of your facility after you're done using it at a 15 to 20 foot distance for scanning uh, human skin temperature. The T5 series. So you guys met, somebody mentioned having a 540. Same idea as the handout for this application. It comes down to ergonomics. Both can be mounted on a tripod. Both have screening mode in it. After this meeting, I'll send out a YouTube link. So if you do have a camera already, it has screening mode in it. And if you're like me, you didn't know it was in there up until four or five months ago, because um, I was looking at all electrical applications, but it is in there. And I'll send out a YouTube video to show you guys exactly how to access it on either your EXX series or your five series cameras. All these cameras are capable of streaming to a desktop, they do also have very large touch screens. So for, for setup, it could be done on the unit, plugged in, ran to a computer monitor, and then watched from a, a safe distance. So again, the A400 and A700 series options, these are more your automated solutions. Um, they're something you would see ran to a control room. Uh, they support OnBIF and web interfacing. Uh, this is something you would see go to a control room and bounce to a front desk. These are the the different built-in features that come with it, and it's what kind of differentiates it from from the rest of the uh, handheld options. Again, questions. That's that's all I have now. I typically have a I call it the bullpen of slide decks of commonly asked questions, such as this one here of what markets are we currently in and it, i mean to be honest with you it's everywhere it's everywhere from manufacturing to entertainment venues maybe not necessarily open yet but planning and setting up these processes um security checkpoints travel and transport but any questions so you i have know, a few I, questions uh, ryan actually yep. a bunch of them on the ir200 but let's go through what we have yep um Again, maybe you can just maybe you can touch on this a little bit different nuance. Why does an IR200 have different reading than a mouth thermometer? Since that is reading not the eye duct, that's reading theoretically temperature. So you're not pointing an IR200 in the eye, you're pointing it at the forehead. So now you're comparing the forehead temperature to the internal mouth temperature. Generally, since this question's being asked several different ways, it could range anywhere from a half a degree up to one degree difference, the temperature in your mouth to the temperature in your forehead. Do not hold me to that. I am not a medical professional. I am not a doctor. I am not the FDA. It can vary drastically. Um, you're reading with the IR200 a forehead temperature, skin temperature. The reason why this is not a first line defense is when all this first started, um, businessmen in Singapore were trying to return back home to China. They were taking cold, damp rags and putting them on their foreheads and manipulating that forehead temperature. Likewise, you can swish around cold water in your mouth and manipulate that temperature. If you're willing to do something like that to your tear ducts, that's dangerous but they will also return back to temperature relatively quickly but the 
the general consensus and the reason why our thermal cameras target the tear ducts is it cannot be manipulated quite as much. The reason why you're using an IR200 after in that post-medical examination process is you still don't want to contact the potentially infected person. You, you don't want to stick a thermometer in their mouth because now you have a infected, potentially infected something, right? You want to let them sit. So if they did manipulate their forehead temperature with say a cold rag, it goes back to normal temperature because they've sat or whatever the process is. Now you can non-contact measure their forehead with an IR200. If it is still being read as above temperature or uh, note for an alarm, at that point, this is where I am not a medical professional. You would need to speak to a nurse on what the process would be for evaluating somebody for a coronavirus. But the idea is confirm without touching as much as possible. Okay, more related questions. Uh, is the IR200 considered a medical device? I guess I didn't say it enough, no. Okay, uh, no, another question. None of our devices are considered medical devices. Got it. Another question related to maybe if somebody has a specific question, they can follow up afterwards. Also, what would be the reason that two IR200s would have different readings from each other when reading the same person at the same time four inches from their forehead? Why would the readings be different with two different IR200s? Uh, so it's a very in-depth scientific reason, but the short of it is, is if you're aiming for two different spots on a forehead, these can't, these IR200s are not as accurate as a FLIR T540, say, less pixels. So if you're putting one pixel on the left side of my forehead that the sun's beating on, and you put another IR200 on another part of my forehead that maybe the sun's not beating on or that I didn't just scratch with my finger, that temperature can be manipulated. There is also a certain percent of error, and you'll see that in the data sheets that I'll send out afterwards on these units. So it is possible to get 98 degrees on one and 98.1 on another just based on error percent. The IR200s are a low cost solution. These are the, the cheapest solution out there that you can buy with an FDA approval on it. It is by no means a FLIR T540 as far as accuracy and repeatability. And that's why it's not the main focus of the screening process because of that accuracy. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna do my best to read this question. <laughs> Is there a difference for a potential user looking at a system that is FDA versus UNE IEC 8060-259 colon 2019 compliant? Wow, this is, that's a first for me. I've never heard that one. Um, so basically it's FDA versus uh, UNE IEC, I guess a European um, standard. Do you know anything about it? I mean, I'm the FLIR guy. I am not a, I'm not a lawyer. I am not a FDA employee. I'll say there, there are notable differences, and this is me speaking from my past life as a dietitian. There are notable, notable differences between every country's version of the FDA. Um, I can't answer that question for you though. Um, that's a legal department question. Um, I would start with Google. Um, if you wouldn't mind emailing me that information, Mark, or yeah. um, whoever asked the question, I, I would like to read about it. Yeah, uh, I okay. guarantee I will not be an expert even after I read about it, but <laughs> I will do my best to help facilitate getting you an answer for that if that is a critical question for you. Okay, another sort of non-technical question. It's a quick one. Can A&M sell A320s? I don't know if you know the answer to that one. Uh, they're actually being discontinued. So although I believe A&M could, they're not really in, being produced anymore. So short of uh, an old used one, they're not really out there. They're being replaced with the A400s and A700s. Okay. 
that's the last question I have so far. Um, we can certainly take any more questions if anybody else has some questions. Well, Ryan, if you like have anything said, else to wrap up? Yeah, like I said, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I know we went through a lot. I know there's a lot of questions on a lot of different things that I didn't have time to cover, nor would I want to subject everybody to listening to. But I will send out afterwards a um, copy of this PowerPoint as well as data sheets on all the units that I mentioned, as well as YouTube videos on what the process looks like and how it works, as well as how-to videos, how to set it up on if you have a FLIR E95 or T540. And again, if you have any questions afterwards, if you read into it and you're not sure about something, reach out to either um, your representative at a and m industrial or reach out reach out to myself and we can work together to to get you an answer and i'll do my best to to get every answer i can and if i can't i'll i will tell you i can't <laughs> great ryan the other thing is again i will follow up with people and uh within the next day or two days we typically have the recording available so i can send out the link so you can go to our website and either share it with a colleague or go back and listen again. If there was something you wanted to listen to again, we'll have the recording available online. So with that, uh, if the, since there are no other questions, Ryan, thank you very much. It was a very uh, powerful presentation, a lot of good information. And thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a great day, and stay safe. Thank you all.